No, it was one of the big gambling houses. Um, I don't know whether it was Ladbrokes or William Hill. Or They're having to close so many, having to close so many shops and make so many people redundant because the government have reduced this. Yet, um, you know, and, and I suppose that is a that, that is a, a blowback of of of, of, of what, what's happened there. But the thing is. That they've also got to be responsible with how many, how much people spend their money because the thing yeah. is they, they can ruin people. But let's think about it for a second again. Average disposal income... Although well, there's also a choice. So people who choose to gamble is a choice. No, there isn't. This is the point. It is a choice. No, it's not. And I'll tell you... I'll, I'll repeat why. Don't forget, our average disposal income is 150 to £450 pounds a month. Um, and, in fact... Even more striking is that research shows that the average person cannot raise a hundred pounds cash immediately. They can't do it. Eighty percent of their profits come from ten percent of their clients. So that ten percent of clients are clearly the gambling addicts, mm -hmm. and by definition, they are gambling much more than 150 to 450 pounds a month and these guys know it the gambling houses know it they are therefore taking advantage of vulnerable individuals and that should be made illegal but, but how, they are how knowingly would you, how would you manage taking that they, it's not a choice you see for these addicts it is not a choice because they are addicted they still have to go and do it I, admittedly there is an addiction but the thing is they can either go and sort it out or they can or they can carry on it's doing it it's a bit it. like so an alcoholic you, you, they just can't Some, you know you, they, they have a condition and, and if you put alcohol in front of an alcoholic they will drink that's that's the thing you have to understand. So so w so isn't there a, like a, uh, there, there there must be a, some sort of organisation like Alcoholics Anonymous for gamblers. I mean, there's yep, yeah, there gamblers is. Anonymous but, as but well. you see, these things just don't work. So the the, the t if you treat an addiction in th with the best possible therapies, the success rate long term is eighteen percent, one eight, mm. um, and therefore most of it is woefully inadequate. And I'll give you an example why they. Uh, they found that if you put if you put uh, nasty pictures of cancer and rotting teeth on cigarette packets, it increases smoking. And the reason is, w w as we've discussed before, mirror neurons. And mirror neurons are cells in our brain that respond to goal-directed behavior, and it's what makes us act as groups of people. It, acts, it makes us all act in a homogeneous way so that we don't act at random when we're in societies and communities. And essentially, if you're addicted you're, and you see something you're addicted to, your mirror neurons spike. So if a cocaine addict watched someone uh, using cocaine, the same neurons in their brain light up as if they're using cocaine. If a cigarette smoker sees these pictures, nasty pictures, it reminds them of smoking. They think they're smoking. They want to smoke. Yes, so if you, if you go into an AA group or you go into a Gamblers Anonymous group and you talk about gambling, guess what? Yeah. You're moving around a spike. You want to gamble. That's right, because the, the, the mind doesn't hear a negative. It doesn't hear a no. So it's like saying to your kid... Um, you know, don't eat the chocolate cake that's in the fridge. Now, they hadn't even thought about it before until you've actually brought it into the forefront of their mind. Yeah. Th th they'll now want it. And and it I, I just figured this out yesterday as I was talking to him um, because he said, it makes me want to eat. And then I thought about it and I thought, my God, it's the same issue as the cigarette packets. If you say, if you talk about alcohol, if you talk about the drug, if you talk about whatever you're addicted to, you will want to go and use it. Now, of course, there are, you know, you're also in an environment where you're feeling supported and unaccepted, but it not, it's not necessarily that effective either because people say, I'm an, I'm an addict, I'm bad. They, they're pretending to be, you know, self-flagellating and accepting, whereas actually, if you're self-flagellating, you're not accepting for a start. Mm. And secondly, if you self-flagellate, guess what? You're treating yourself like a bad person. And by your mirror neurons, you will behave like a bad person. So again, that is some of the fundamental flaws of these groups. 
which is why the average success rate is 18% <laughs> is that rather right, yeah. than much higher. So I mean, the thing is, I mean, you, you, you go look at some of, because um, I'm, I'm sure there must be gambling, how, I'm, I'm sure you can do online gambling in the States. Because yes. the thing is, even if you, even if, you know, um, but the thing is, they, um, even before that became available, you know, gambling was restricted to a s- few certain areas like Las Vegas and things like this even if you're example because I was in Miami and you can't go gambling in Miami you have to go on one of these um, almost like these boats which are uh, in, then in international waters if you actually want to go and gamble so um, I, for someone who's a gambling addict like that, can't actually is not going to go on a. Actually, they could go on a boat trip every single day, but it's because it's m- made it a little bit harder for them to be able to do. Um, you you probably won't get as many, mm. you uh, and you just go for the experience. I think I think these companies um, need to have their profits confiscated b- and and under the, under the principle of uh, ill-gotten gains. I, I, well, I mean, I don't like it. I, mean, I, I don't particularly like the um, industry. Um, but then again, I, I, but I, I don't gamble. Um, you see, there's a, there's a big difference between gambling on horses, where maybe you can gamble five or six times a day, versus every eight seconds. Think about that for a second. Every eight seconds. That is designed to take your blood out of you. And if you're an addict... You see, the, the, the key thing why gambling is so addictive is the is because it's the most addictive form of behavioral reinforcement, and that is intermittent variable ratio positive reinforcement. In other words, you know you're going to win, you just don't know when. Intermittent variable ratio positive reinforcement. It's but a bit like fishing. But fishing yeah, but is addictive. But most of these people will then end up winning and then they'll still spend it all, they'll still put it all back in anyway. That's it. Bec- because it's intermittent variable ratio positive reinforcement. Because they know they'll win eventually. They just don't know when. Mm. And that's what they're living for rather than... And it's a, it's, it's a very interesting thing. It's a bit like love. It's a bit like love really because you're looking for the good thing and ignoring the bad, aren't you? Um, and that's why most people have disastrous relationships because you chase the ideal. Whereas, same with gambling, you're you're chasing the ideal of the win, and you're ignoring all the losses you've got in between. Well, there you go. How long have you got left, anyway? Uh, just let me just minutes. check. Hmm? Eight minutes. You got eight minutes left. So, so I just want to get a quick recap in terms of. Um, you know, stress. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go back to stress. I mean, the thing is, um, you know, you talk about you've talked about the heart, and we and you've and you've described what it is and everything, and you've made a couple of indications as to actually what's within your control to be able to reduce it. Well, you see, but what, what, but what is a quick win that you can actually give people in terms of reducing stress? A quick win. A hard question. It's a very hard question because there are so many things to do. The the I think that the quick win would be to ask yourself two questions. Whenever you're stressed about something, ask yourself, do I need to do this or do I want to do this? If you don't need to do it and you don't want to do it, then please don't do it and consider doing something you want to do. Because so many people live a life doing what they think they need to do, but not what they want to do. And that's the, that's the number one thing, actually, because, as I said to you, because we're on this treadmill of, of uh, reflex anxiety reduction, which another term for it is called instant gratification, it, because it's all the same thing. It's about reflexly reducing your anxiety. Then you're constantly doing what you think you need to do, whether it's pleasing people, whether it's achieving things, but very rarely doing what you want to do. I'll, and I'll give you an example. One of my one of my patients was world champion at his particular sport. And I said, I said, do you like it? And he said, I love it. I love being world champion. I said, hmm, no, 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 do you, do, do you like it? He said, I love being world champion. Love it, love it, love it. I said, no, 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 no. Do you like your sport? He said, hate it, can't stand it. Okay. Um, so he was doing what he thought thought he needed to do to be world champion, but he was not a happy person. 
So perhaps he'd have been. He'd so he loved being world. Sorry, he loved being world champion. Well, he loved the achievement of world champion, but he hated the process. And th- and the point to make is that most of the ju- most of life is the journey. So you better enjoy the journey. Of course, it is. I mean, champions are actually made in training. They're not actually made on the. Um, they're not made on the day. And um, it's actually there was. Um, there were, I remember f- a few years ago there were two middle distance runners, Steve Ovet and Seb. Co. Seb Co. And Seb Co would even go running on Christmas. He, he would even train on Christmas Day. Um, and and when I think I think it was something like his wife said, you, "Why don't you just take the day off?" And he says, "Because, because Steve Ovette will actually be training today." So, um, but he, he th- that but that was that was the life he actually chose to be able to do. Um, and there's a lot of hard work that goes in the background that people don't actually see. So even the people who come across as saying actually I have a very you know free lifestyle I live a lifestyle and whatever and they don't look to be working much they work really hard I mean if you look at even you know I think if you look at sort of um Branson on his uh, in, in in Necker Island one of the first things he'll probably do in the morning is check his emails to see out of the 400 companies that he owns what's actually going on admittedly he's he's, he's let a bit a lot of it go but he's actually still very very active in all that um, and he actually worked very very hard for it and he probably still does we just don't we just don't see how much he does in the background because he's flying here and he's flying everywhere and let's face it it's not nice um, you know and, and and you, if, if, if you've ever been um, one of those people who've actually travelled around the world on a plane and staying in hotels, actually, it's n- it may sound exciting, but the thing is, all you're going is one from one office room in London to one office room in Barcelona to one office room in Chile and then back again. Mm. Um, it's not the most exciting lifestyle, but what the, what the outcome of what they get is that is the financial benefit for them I think the, uh, which you in some ways would call un- illusionary needs he is undoubtedly a very very clever man isn't he Richard Branson um, exceptionally capable on more than one level um, uh, I saw I saw him once actually in um, in Marylebone at seven o'clock in the evening, um, clearly having just come out of a meeting, uh, and he had some advisor, um, and he, th- he seemed to be so busy that the advisor was 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 trying to have some form of meaningful communication with him as they were walking along. And he was walking with his head bent in, in quite a good-natured way so that the advisor could speak to him. Um, but that's a unbelievably wealthy guy working hard at seven in the evening. Um, and who knows when he was going to stop. You know, and, 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 that's, and that's a thing you've got to consider when we talk about the people who are at the top and you talk about the one percenters or, or even the top, even, even top 10% or 6% of people, really, if you actually want to put it in that level. They actually work extremely long hours. They're prepared to make a lot of sacrifices. They're probably workaholics. And the thing is, they're not going to be pushed aside because, um, you know, identity politics or someone says it they are they are very very committed to that and they're willing to go to p- they're willing to take measures that the that the average person isn't willing to do and the thing is you, you criticize them for sometimes for having so much more money and quite being quite abusive but the thing is they actually work really hard for it they've taken the risk for it as well and in some ways, if they actually weren't there, and actually if you actually look at what happened in Venezuela when Chavez decided to nationalize all these companies, look what happened. So, so when I hear people criticizing all these big corporate firms, and I've got to say some of them are shockingly bad. Um, you know, there, there, there could be there's a level, there's a moral code that they, that they probably should adhere to, they should consider. But the thing is, there's, a, there's this woman who criticizes all these large companies, yet yeah, she's the one who's actually using the iPhone, uh, the latest iPhone. So she, you know, if, if, those, if those were her principles, then don't bo- then don't, the, then the, don't there's, bo- there's normal karma. The the fact is that um, that what that what typically happens is these enormous companies start off by being run by a charismatic individual with a vision. We talked about this last week. So vision is what's necessary for success. But then as, as the 
individual, you know, disappears, dies, is replaced, then essentially what you're left with is a an enormous corporation uh, that has the same rights as a human, which is purely profit-based and is therefore, uh, by definition, a psychopath. And eventually there is karma, and these r- these corporations die out. So the the st- mathematically, there's a normal sigmoid-shaped lifespan. There's a slow start, an enormous acceleration, a plateauing, and then it falls off a cliff. Okay.